So I just wanted the images to be like accompanying more um, image. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure if you needed anything else for your reading, like on this screen, do you need it? I think I should be able to keep it on the Okay. It's fine. Uh, just let me know if it's something else. But it's just these and then um, you just do it in slideshows. And then it's just the down arrow will transfer to different slides. Um, and then if you need to get out of it, it's just a state.
Is that the yeah. better route? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I don't hear it at all now. Yeah, I don't know if you want to try to talk to the mic. Yes. Check, check, check. I recognize the name, but I don't know them. Hello, hello. Really? No more sound. Yeah. Yeah. afternoon session of colloquia. Again, I'm Kevin Magruder, Associate Professor of History. This morning, we had several students in humanities, languages, and the arts who gave their presentation. And this afternoon, we're going to have two students in humanities continue to talk about their senior project. And the first one up is Lexi Payton. Writing is healing and it is deeply personal. 
Um, I began writing as a child as a way for me to rationalize and contemplate big feelings, feelings that felt too big for my tiny body. And I think that in, in writing, it actually teaches me to care a little bit more about the world around me. My project specifically is a uh, 15,000 word novella in flash called Paper Cranes, as you can see over here. Um, it has themes of love and loss and trauma and healing. Uh, the shortest piece is around 35 words and the longest piece is around 1,500 words. So as you can see from the table of contents, um, a novella in flash is a compilation of short pieces. Um, but what is a novella in flash? I didn't really even know until like three months ago when I took Robin's uh, creative writing course and I learned that a novella in flash for me is very freeing. Um, flash in simple terms are uh, pieces of writing that are 100 to 1,000 words and that kind of depends on uh, what source you use to look at that because uh, flash is a relatively new form of creative writing even though it's been around for a long time. Um, the novella in Flash blends the brevity of short flash pieces with the dark part of a novella, effortlessly mixing the quick and sustained into a whole. And Flash is distinctive in its ability to capture fleeting moments with details focusing on specific memories or occasionally objects. Um, it allows writers to focus less on the structure of pieces and more on the moment that they're trying to capture. So for me, that's, that's what has been freeing. I'm focusing less about um, the structure or how stanzas should be structured or if it should rhyme or not. I'm focusing on what does this feeling feel like and why do I feel like that. Um, and in reading and writing Flash, I've been contemplating a little bit about the world around us. And I think that in our world today, we are accustomed to things being built for efficiency. And I think that Flash is great in that aspect because it, it drops you into a moment in time and then that's like amazing for people with short attention spans. It's, it's great. Um, it's a short <laughs> piece of writing, it's awesome. Um, but in writing Flash, I've learned that um, it's important to pay attention to the details and to the magic of every day. Um, these small moments are meant to be big moments, and in the flash form, these moments are able to take up space that they might not be able to in traditional literature. Flash allows the writer to get at the heart of each thought and emotion, and writing flash for me has been freeing. In flash, magic exists. And so today, I'm going to be sharing a few stories, um, four stories. The first one and the last one are a little bit longer, and the two in between them are shorter. So, my first story is called Crazy Cat Lady. <laughs> okay. I lived next door to a retired school bus driver. She was my favorite neighbor because she was nice, and I always thought she was pretty in an unconventional way. Her thick, full moon-shaped eyeglasses covered the vast majority of her face, surpassing her cheekbones and making it to the bottom of her nose. Her nose was wide and long, and she was missing her top teeth, so when she smiled, she stood out. Her hair was wild and untamed, flying in the ways that it wanted to. She wore old college crew necks and sweatpants that fit her like a plastic bag. She was a simple woman in what she enjoyed and loved. She liked cigarettes and cats. She lived with three high school students that she took under her wing. One of them had a baby. She had five cats, and the cats also had babies. In her backyard, she had an above-ground pool that she did not keep maintained. Her pool, left open to the willing atmosphere, collected rainwater, bugs, leaves, and dirt over time. I watched over the years from my bedroom window as it filled to the top with dirty water, waxing and waning as the summer sun worked to evaporate the water, while the weekly showers replenished the self-sustaining ecosystem. The top of the water had a film of sludgy algae, and as time progressed, plants began to sprout and reach for the sky, growing out of the murky water. She didn't mind the forest green tent of her uncoordinated pool. 
She didn't seem to mind the frogs and the mosquitoes that built a habitat of her above ground pond. She liked it that way, but my father <coughs> did not. He called her the crazy cat lady. And in our backyard grew a young crab apple tree. The fruit of the tree would fall to the ground around the same time every year, approximately the same time of year that the crazy cat lady's pool would fill to the brink. The fruit rotting in our backyard had a fleshy smell. The fruit disintegrating and returning to the earth felt sour compared to the wild honeysuckle that grew along our rusting chimney fence. Before the fruit was too far gone and rotten, when there were a few apples that had just fallen and plenty of ripe apples still hanging on the branches, those apples were perfect. Not for eating, because they are small and sour, but rather for throwing. I learned in the summers I liked to throw the rotting crab apples in the crazy cat lady's pool to see just how far I could make it. Sometimes my best efforts failed. I couldn't make the shot into the pool and the crab apples would hit the side of the pool with a muffled blow. But those efforts made the successful shots sweeter. Swish, score. Another one making it past the fence and into the water, causing infinite ripples bellowing out to the sides of the pool. I liked watching the fruit bob to the surface of the water. I liked watching the plants in her pool sway as the ripples hit them. What do you think you're doing, young lady? My father called after me as he watched the sixth or seventh crap apple. I lost count and moved my fingertips and soared over the fence. He was standing outside of our house. It was always young lady. I could smell the beer on his hot breath as he got closer to me. I felt the droplets of his warm saliva stick to my skin like hot glue. It never felt real, but this time it was happening outside of our house. Maybe someone would see, or maybe the crazy cat lady would hear. I didn't blame her for not hearing. Our house was contained. The kids on our side of the street told me that our house looked like the White House. And while throwing crab apples in the crazy cat lady's pool, I wondered if she would catch me. I daydreamed about being caught by her because maybe that would mean I could see what lies beyond her brick walls. I wondered if her house was as contained as mine. Her pool was not. Part of my father's punishment for throwing crab apples in her pool, as if the small useless fruits were what tarnished it, was forcing me to apologize to the crazy cat lady. When I apologized to her over the rusting fence, she laughed, and she laughed hard. Mm -hmm. She laughed so hard that she started coughing. She lit another cigarette. Her pool was just how she liked it, crab apples and all. And in our backyard, next to our crab apple tree, was another above ground pool. My father had it installed one day while my siblings and I were at school. It was, beginning, it was the beginning of the spring season, far too cold to swim, but we swam in it anyway. Our pool was chlorinated, and it was our responsibility to clean it. We skimmed the water every day for bugs and the occasional rotting crab apple. Our pool was five feet deep, and the water was fresh from the backyard, closed, ice cold. We covered the pool with a blue tarp when it rained. My family even took water samples up to the place where my father bought the pool. We made sure our pool was clean. Without all these efforts to keep our pool maintained, I wondered how long it would take to create its own ecosystem with plants and frogs and bugs. The next year, my father cut down the crab apple tree, and when I got home from school, all that was left was a stump and rotten fruit falling deep into the soil. He didn't like that the crab apples were falling into our pool. He winked at me and said he didn't want our pool to look like the crazy cat ladies. In the summer after our crab apple tree was cut down, the city forced my neighbor to move from her house. And the last time I saw her, she was cleaning her pool, the dirty water up to her neck. She and her kids used white pails to remove the green water, splashing it on the grass below. Leftover crab apples that no longer resembled what they once were, tumbling into the earth. That's my first story. Thank you. second story is called Wishing. My older sister is full of luck. Conveniently, she finds four-leaf clovers almost every time she sets foot onto grass. I think sometimes that maybe she's just lucky like that, but I also don't believe in luck. Dandelions, loose eyelashes on my freckled sun-kissed cheeks, shooting stars, pennies thrown into water fountains, 
My friend from school told me that if you lift your legs when you drive over train tracks and hold your breath, that it's good luck. An ancient Japanese legend promises that anyone who folds a thousand paper cranes will be granted a wish by the gods. Every year, the same cake made by my mom, the same wish. Blowing out the candles on my birthday every year, I look at the fire, the flames engulfing my cake with thick buttercream frosting. The 22 candles sit before me as my eyes glow with the force of the fire. I inspect the room around me to see my loved ones awaiting what seems to be the climax of every birthday. I think maybe that they're just waiting for cake. I inhale, collecting as much air in my lungs as humanly possible. Feeling my lungs expand to the size of my body, body cavity, I am on edge and I glow. I am told that if I don't extinguish the flames completely, my wish will not come true. If all of the seeds from the damp lion don't fly forth with my breathless efforts, I will never get my wish. I am 22 years old, and for the past 10 years I have wished for the same thing. But I have never told anyone what I wish for, because then it won't come true. That's my second statement. <laughs> This one's pretty short, it's like a paragraph. <laughs> it's called Playing with Fire. My lucky sister liked to play with fire when I was younger. She would take small slips of paper she ripped out from her composition notebooks for our, our family brought for school to light them on fire with a lighter she stole from our parents. She'd sit there watching the paper catch all at once, and then just as fast as the paper caught, she'd stomp the flames out on the ground so it wouldn't spread. I loved watching her do this but I wasn't as lucky as her. Even as a small child, I was always prepared. I kept a pitcher of water ready, just in case something went awry. It's that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then my last story that I'm sharing is actually the last um, piece of my novella, and I think it kind of uh, wraps up all of the ideas that I have pretty well. Um, and it's called A Letter. <clears throat> This is the part of the story that nobody wants to hear. This is a letter for myself when I want to die. I know how it feels to be sad and mad and hurting, but there are trees still, and you love those. The smell of dirt and pine, the way the canopies house critters that sing. You like the way that the shadows of the leaves form on the ground, the way the light flutters through the creases. You love that sometimes if you close your eyes, Feeling sunshine on your skin feels like you're being touched. You have felt these things before. One day, when your brain is calmer and nicer to you, you will look at you will see all of the great things again, like looking through your library of books you've accumulated from past lovers and friends. Some books are stolen because you believe that books should be free, but you especially love the books others give you because it is a piece of them given to you. You write notes on the margins inside your books so that when you reread them, you can know exactly how you felt before. You have felt this before, just as you have felt happiness before. And I know that the sadness is overwhelming, but there are gentle things, gentle things like warm sweaters and books and cups of tea. I know you are trying, and I know you are giving it your all. Summer will come again and you will sit at your kitchen table wrecked with love. It will be overflowing with baked goods, the smell of sweetness warming the air. The pots are cleaned, the goodies are cooled. You find beauty in the smallest things. Lemons and their contradictions, how you can create something sweet out of something bitter. Waves and their push and pull, how they melt on the shore leaving shells for people to collect, how people collect shells and rocks and weird things like buttons and quarters. Soft grass, cherry tomatoes, oil pastels and Moscow noodles made with fresh lime, lavender, smoke, wind, and dancing. Emotion, the good and the bad that come with it. You want to visit the desert one day. You want to catch fireflies with the love of your life, and you want to dance in the refrigerator light. You want to listen to rain on your front porch. There are stars in the sky, and even the idea of that makes you ecstatic, because how rare is it to even exist? How beautiful is it to be here right now? 
Even if you don't know how to live, even when you are lost, it is simple. There will always be trees. There will always be magic. back on it, it's, it is a lot, and it's, it's 
like I said before, I think that we're accustomed to things being about efficiency and being able to do it fast and quickly. And I think in a way that that's one thing, but I think that it's important to slow down and really be here and be now because then you're going to miss out on the magic if you don't do that. And I think in working with kids, I've definitely, definitely thought a lot about that because every day is different and <laughs> um, that's amazing. And I love, I love that. That's probably one of my favorite parts about being a teacher is that every, every day is different and every kid is different. So it's important to be present in the, in the now. And that's hard sometimes, but we're here, we're doing it. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to call attention to the fact that you didn't just write the story, you also like uh, designed and visually crafted like a printed book, um, and uh, which I really appreciate. And I um, just wondered, is there a way to get the book? Is there a way? I've actually been thinking about that a lot because people keep asking me, so I'm thinking about it for sure, definitely. But I'm not, I'm not really sure how to do. That it's here. not like an online print on demand kind of thing. No, but it's okay. 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 Just a thought. <laughs> Thank you. Matt, this is sort of going back to Lisa's question in a way, but there's just so much in here with the form about time that I, I kind of want to ask you um, a very related question. Um, because I, I, the part about um, when you were reading, going back to books where you had written marginalia to remember what you were thinking mm -hmm. when you first read it. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's the immediacy, but then there's also the layers mm -hmm. that are present in these um, moments. So I guess um, the splash fiction also, or do these different forms of writing make you think differently about time in ways that are maybe more layered or, or more even more heavy than just the immediate. Um, like there are poems that I've read that have made me think so differently, mm -hmm. like counting my life in hours of daylight mm -hmm. or like thinking about, um, yeah, just time becomes a very malleable concept that's so full, um, deep with meaning, especially when you're, when you're doing these layers. Yeah, totally, for sure, I think that in, in writing this, I started with writing a little bit about um, previous relationships that I've been in, how that felt for me. But I also, st then in doing that, I was also thinking about my childhood and how my adverse childhood experiences shaped who I am today and how I navigate relationships. So yes, I have, it, it was interesting to see how that like, because I, I, I didn't really have a plan for it. I kind of just uh, developed a character that was based on myself and then um, kind of let it roll. But in doing that, I wrote a little bit about the present and a little bit about my past and figuring out where that went and the, the general flow of the narrative arc was very difficult. And, interesting, Robin and I sat down and we actually like wrote down all of my stories on note cards and place them different in <laughs> So yes, um, I thought a lot about time um, and its blessings and its curses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Next is Sophie Singer. I've wanted to do a children's book um, for about two years, but 
It has shifted in form and subject matter since then. I decided on conifers as a subject matter um, because I feel as though they are a neglected subject uh, within the limited botanical education that children receive in the public educational system. Um, I remember being in first grade and being taught about the different types of trees, evergreen and palm and deciduous, um, but none of this was ever elaborated on further past that. Um, conifers have always felt like an enigma to me. Their design seems to fly in the face of everything that we are told about other plants with their broad leaves and their flowers. Um, even as I was writing this, I realized how little I actually knew about them, these organisms that I passed and interacted with every day. Um, I want to foster curiosity in the world around us, and I hope this book can help to do that. Um, okay. Hello. Hey there. Nice to meet you. My name is Connie. I'm a conifer cone. I carry seeds that grow into trees. I hope to be one when I'm grown. What is a conifer? That's a strange word. To understand, there's some things you must know. What is a plant? What is a tree? And how do they both grow? Well, what is a plant? It's a living thing, just like you or me. A plant can look like a small flower or a tall and mighty tree. For humans to go, we need to grow, we need to eat. Our stomachs digest food, like veggies or meat. Food gives us energy to move and to play, and nutrients from food help us to grow every day. Now plants don't have these things you know, like mouths or stomachs to help them grow. The way that they eat is peculiar and fun. Most plants make their own food from the sun. How do plants do this? How do they feed? Where is the food made? What do they need? The first ingredient is chlorophyll, which does not go unseen. It helps to trap the sun's energy and is the thing that makes plants green. The other two ingredients are quite plain, carbon dioxide from air and water from rain. Stomata are tiny holes in the leaves. When they open up, they help the plant breathe. The plant drinks water using its roots, absorbing it from the dirt. It brings the water to the stem and leaves and makes it stand alert. When all of these things work together, surprise, it helps the plant photosynthesize. Now you might be saying, that's a big word, dude. It's just one way to say how plants make their food. This food provides the energy that the plant needs to grow bigger and bigger and make pollen and seeds. Uh, this process makes food for the plant, it's true, but it breathes out oxygen and water too. Now on the basics of plants, we agree. So it must be asked, exactly what is a tree? A tree is a plant just like any other, just a whole lot bigger and a whole lot tougher. A tree has roots that dig deep in the ground, a big wooden trunk, and a big leafy crown. A trunk is like a big wide stem you see, bringing water and nutrients from the roots to the leaves. It's a type of plant that is grown wide and tall to compete for sunlight with things that are small. What do you picture when you think of a tree, a tropical palm, or a tall hickory? There's another type of tree that is not often known, with leaves like needles and seeds in a cone. It all got its start a long time ago, over 300 million years. Before the dinosaurs walked the earth is when these plants appeared. They belong to a group called the gymnosperms, another big word indeed. It has a simple meaning, though, and is Greek for naked seed. The place in plants where seeds are made is called the ovary. In plants with flowers, it sits deep inside, away from all the seed. Flowers produce pollen, too, in structures called stamen. Yes, it's true. Gymnosperms are a different case, with no flowers to be seen. Most grow their uh, seeds in woody cones, not soft casings that are green. Their pollen comes from cones as well, smaller and softer, with no hard shell. Conifers are a type of these, gymnosperms and also trees. In winter, some are easy to spot, which trees are green and which are not. Most leaves of conifer are not wide and flat. They look kind of like needles, how about that? 
These needles are great for a couple of reasons. They help the tree conserve water and survive colder seasons. When the earth freezes over, other plants lose their leaves, but conifers continue to make food as they please. Conifers can live all over the world, but there's a few places they like best to grow. The north and the mountains are common, where it's chilly and it snows. Most conifers in these places don't lose their needles on routine. They're known that to all that see them as the mighty evergreen. Instead of losing leaves all at once, like other trees in the autumn air, they lose a few at a time, like humans and their hair. Another neat thing many can do is to secrete resin, a unique sticky goo. Have you ever scraped your knee while you played? Did you need to clean it and use a band-aid? Resin is like that for a tree too. It keeps bugs and germs out of a boo-boo. <laughs> <laughs> there are many different types of conifers we can name, like pine, spruce, and fir, which are not all the same. Pine trees have longer, thin needles that all grow from one place uh, in bundles and bunches attached at the base. Spruce trees have needles which are not quite so big. They are short, sharp, and round and circle the twig. A fir tree's needles are also quite squat, but are soft, flat, and friendly more often than not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> more often than not. <laughs> um, other types of conifers include cedar and yew, plus hemlocks and junipers, to name a few. Uh, their cones, needles, and branches all vary greatly. Some stand close to the ground, some stand tall and stately. Some have typical hard woody cones to shelter its seeds. Some have false fruit called arrows to help with this need. Near the equator, not many are found. Flowering plants all rule the ground. The wind is something that conifers need to spread its pollen to make more seeds. In a tropical forest, the air barely stirs. That is no place for spruces or firs. Conifer trees hold records for size and for age the tallest, thickest, and oldest, by humans' best gauge. Some have developed unique ways to thrive. The bald cypress sheds needles in drought to survive. Bald cypress have knees that poke above water, holding them down when it's windy so they don't fall or totter. Some adapted to live in wildfire zones. These rely on high temperatures to open their cones. Their scales are sealed tightly with a homemade wax. It melts and the cone opens when the heat is at its max. Some conifers do not even have needles, although they are not a lot. They have broad, flat leaves like their flowering cousins and typically grow where it's hot. In nature, no species works truly alone, no matter the habitat. Plants, animals, and others all depend on each other, from an elephant to a gnat. Conifers help to support creatures of plenty, providing food and shelter for many. Their branches are places where some take refuge. Pine nuts feed small jays and grizzly bears that are huge. These birds hide seeds away in their cache, and hungry bears find their food with a smash. Conifers have lots in common, but are still pretty weird and diverse in the way that they look, where they grow, and how their seeds disperse. The fact of the matter, which is this, remains true. Just like humans, every conifer is different, but they're alike in many ways, too. Shout out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, but I wrote most of this as a final project for that, and then I sort of got really attached to it and decided to um, make edits and expand. Um, I don't know. I, in terms of rhyming, I would kind of write down the ideas that I was trying to um, have come across, and then um, just kind of try to find like a cadence and, and words that I could, I don't know, it was kind of like a puzzle almost, like fit into places and, and make it work. Um, I'm sorry, did you also, oh, in terms of the illustrations as well, um, those have been a labor of love over the past <laughs> quarter. Um, I am not incredibly talented when it comes to the visual arts. Um, last, it took until last winter quarter for me to get my first art credit um, <laughs> for my entire time being here at Antioch College. Um, but I don't know, I took uh, the Media 101 class and kind of gained some basic skills in Photoshop and um, just kind of used that to try to craft the images that I was picturing in my head. Yeah, Kevin. At, at one point, you explored testing this with children. Did you have that opportunity? I did not. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'd like to do in the future because it's something, it's a project I'd like to continue to pursue and kind of move forward, but um, just with kind of the time crunch of Colloquia that didn't end up happening. <laughs> yeah, that's four. <laughs> <laughs> Um, June, you had a question? I know you were talking at one point about publishing. Um, are you still thinking about publishing? Do you hope to get it published in the future? Yes, but... <laughs> uh, maybe once I have a little bit more time and energy to devote to, uh, like, actually making it a publishable, like, product. Oh, uh, Forrest. Yeah, um, let me know if you need help doing more of a book layout or something. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, I mean, I heard you're teeing in the fall. <laughs> um, uh, there is a design class in the fall that also does stuff like that too, so if you're interested. Okay. But um, I was also thinking uh, a good opportunity might be to read it at the Antioch School because they're just over there. Yeah. And, um, I think the teachers there would be really receptive to a story like this. They actually have a program there that's art and sciences together, and I think they would really enjoy this story. So, not a question, sorry. <laughs> Brooke, you here? Um, this is going to be great, so thank you so much. Um, I just want to underscore the idea that there is, in fact, a lack of scientific um, text in the children's, you know, big picture literature world, I would really encourage you to move forward to seek publishing. Um, an editor will help you add polish, right? Your imagery has power and movement. It's it's really um, singular, it's unique. Your your words, your narrative has a Seussian kind of rhythm that always gets kids into the flow. And like Kim said, also with her word, the science is accurate. So you have something that's actually really special and I would know. Really encourage you to figure out what the next steps are. I have three kids, I'm going to take care of 12 kids, I read a lot of stories <laughs> for a lot of kids, and I'm telling you there is a need and a desire for exactly what you've created. Well done. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to the last two presenters for including this. Uh, Forrest, you were quick in my brain, I was thinking about art and science too. And um, I've always been impressed about how um, artists and scientists are both looking at the world around us. We just kind of have, sometimes we're seeing the same object, but like with a totally different toolkit. And it's just another way of understanding that, you know, what we are man-made world, natural world, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's something that, that I really spend a lot of time thinking about. And this would be so much more effective than like a kid textbook. Do you know what I'm saying? Because textbooks can suck the life out of things. 
So also kudos to Sophie because she was the last presenter in her trees class last year and she blew everybody out of the water. <laughs> Instructors, this is, I think, probably our favorite time of year because we get to see students who, Bravo and I were talking about it, some might have been struggling early in the quarter and we were trying to convince them of what they could do and now they know what, <laughs> what's possible. And uh, so I just you know, want to congratulate all the students who presented today. Um, does anybody know what comes next this afternoon? Is there another? Okay, session for us. I think the, the arts are spread around. Okay. Yeah. So, performance and, and so they're going to be at different parts of the campus. I think so. Okay. Okay, so. So the next. Rick. I think 6 p.m. is Maria Rivera's performance, but I don't know that. Okay. Tomorrow. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so, but that's all to say this isn't the end of presentations. Keep on the lookout, they'll be happening in different parts. The campus. I think Michael Casillas' class is doing a fashion show today. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And where is that going to be? Does anybody know? Oh, I'm. Yeah, I'm in that class it's tonight at nine in the Foundry Theater. Okay. So stay tuned. A lot happening. Support our students. Um, this is their time. Thank you. <laughs>